I think many people have heard about the fact that many bacteria, pathogens for humans become resistant to antibiotics. But this is actually also the case for fungi. So fungi are like, we, we know yeast is our friend. So yeast helps us baking and helps us brewing beer, all the good things. But actually many yeasts are also pathogens to humans. So they can cause really severe infections, especially in immunocompromised humans. In this episode, I'm talking with ETH alumna and scientist Sonia Billerbeck, who is an assistant professor in molecular microbiology at the U's University of Groningen in the Netherlands. This is the We Are ETH podcast, and I'm Susan Kish, your host. Sonia, how did you get interested in these areas around biology and microbiology and microbiomes? What sparked your interest in this field? It's a really good question. And uh, I get this question actually right frequently. And I wish I had a very inspirational story about it that goes <laughs> all the way back to my youth or my childhood. I know, you were two years old and you crawled across the floor and said, oh. I think it just organically grew that during my biology studies, which was uh, where, where I chose or where I realized just by, you know, attending different lectures that I was very much interested in more the biochemical or the molecular details about biology. And explicitly about microbiology was what sparked my interest was actually metabolism at the time. So I found it very intriguing that microbes mm -hmm. do not only breathe oxygen and do not only eat sugars like we do, but they have like all these different varieties of metabolism that they use and that, that give them the ability to grow in a, in, in a lot of different environments in the deep sea and the Antarctic. So is synthetic microbiology, is that sort of where computer science meets microbiology or what is exactly synthetic microbiology? Uh, yeah, great question. So in beads, so I'm not a computational biologist. Oh, those are different. They're not necessarily different. It's just I never learned much coding and I, 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 I hate Sonia, that fact, but it's, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But now, I can, now I'm in a position where I can hire people who do that for me and it feels great. Got it. So, but it, it definitely has the feeling of putting engineering into biology. And engineering also, hmm. of course, goes along with maybe something that can be simulated uh, and predicted. So it, mm -hmm. of course, needs computational tools. But computational biology is, of course, a much bigger field. But definitely, it wasn't like synthetic biology in its origin, at least how I see it, was inspired by electrical engineering and more like computer-guided, computer-aided design. Because biotechnology in the 1980s and the first genomes of microbes were sequenced, you had a huge promise. So people thought, okay, now we can like, you know, engineer microbes to boost medicines and like make all these revolutions. But the dream didn't become true. So people huh. needed a long time to engineer these microbes. And it was like very difficult. It was a lot of trial and error and people started reinventing the real. So I think the idea of synthetic biology is really how can we make this dream come true that we can really use the variety of different biologically encoded function and put them together in ways and make them work for us in a way like that to address human challenges. But we can only do that if we do it kind of like a bit more systematically and maybe also a bit in a predictive way. And that's where the engineering comes in? Where the engineering comes in, but it's the realization of the discipline is also that biological engineering is really distinct from computational or let's say from electrical engineering or from uh, normal engineering, how we know it, because we work with a lot of black boxes. And I think that was also huh. the, at least to me, the major realization of the field is like, you really have to address biological engineering slightly different than electrical engineering. So I think this comparison was useful in the beginning to kind of like transmit the concept, but it didn't hold true for the practical side to actually get something engineered in biology. Fantastic. We're going to return to this topic. However, I just wanted to understand. So it sounds like Groningen sounds like an idyllic university town. It sounds like it was a fabulous experience. What was the catalyst for you to move down to Zurich? Another idyllic town, but not Groningen. Uh, so yeah, actually it was Tübingen. So the, the two Tübingen. songs. Very oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. No worries. It's two Ingen towns, uh, coincidentally. Personally, I'm a person who likes to travel and like live, live in different places. So for me, science was also a way to just explore different parts of the world. So it was clear to me that after my master, I wanted to move somewhere else. 
I think at the time I was uh, with my partner and he had already gotten a position at ETH. So I have to admit that oh. I was just triggered because ETH to me was this like very um, elite institute and I kind of didn't see myself there. It, I know it was aware of it and I knew they were also doing all these cool engineering and maybe it would even be the place where I could even participate in what I was becoming interesting in. But at the time it was... It just seemed very, yeah, I don't know, a bit out of my league. But then actually, uh, which is like, yeah, interesting looking back. But then actually when my partner started his PhD there, I started to meet just, you know, people, PhD students, maybe one of the other postdoc, his mentor. And I realized, well, you know, it's just people there like me. So um, I started searching for open positions and uh, I knew that Sven Panke, who eventually became my uh, supervisor, he had a position open in exactly what I had become interested in and it's kind of cool which was like just engineering uh, microbiology like uh, during my studies I kind of became interested in microbiology all these different functions that microbes have and then when I heard about synthetic biology also a bit through my history studies Mm -hmm. I was like wow what if we cannot only understand all these different functions but really engineer them and put them together in different ways. So this sounded like very intriguing to me. And this was at the time kind of like the core of synthetic biology. And not that many research groups in Europe actually had picked up on that, but Sven was one of them. So he was a bit mm-hmm. kind of like the leading figure in Europe. So I felt like, great, I, I, I just <laughs> going to send my application and, uh, and then he hired me and uh, yeah. What was your next step? Yeah, so my next step, I moved to do a postdoc at Columbia University in uh, New York City. Nice. Yeah, this was more, again, in synthetic biology, but rather, so in Sven's lab, I had very much focused on metabolism, but in, in so-called cell-free systems. So it was like very biochemical, yeah, focused on, on, on fine chemical production. So very applied, very biochemical metabolism focused in bacteria and cell-free systems. And uh, I wanted to also move a bit more into higher organisms. So really try to understand how this engineering would really work in like a bit higher organisms, and I, I chose to do that in yeast. So uh, Saccharomyces, the baker's yeast, yeah. Oh, cool. I knew one PI, Virginia Cornish. She's a, a, a full professor at the chemistry department at Columbia. And uh, well, I could apply for a fellowship from the Swiss Science Foundation, a postdoctoral mm-hmm. fellowship. So I reached out to her if she would be willing to kind of like co-write a proposal with me and, uh, you know, potentially host me. And uh, then we started emailing and, uh, yeah, I, I eventually got this fellowship and uh, I moved into her lab. And then there I also applied for an American fellowship, which I then also coincidentally got. So I had like funding for four years of uh, postdoctoral work. And uh, yeah, that's what I pursued over there in New York. Yeast is interesting. Is yeast, what is it? Is it an animal? Is it a mushroom, a fungus? Is it a plant? What is yeast? It, it is actually a fungus. Other than the stuff that's in the little packet that I use when I make bread. <laughs> <laughs> so indeed, it's it's a microorganism. It's a fungus. So it's indeed, it's a, it's a single-celled fungus. Huh. And yeah, yeast is basically just, a, because for many people, yeast is really the, the, the packaged powder, the baker's right. yeast. But it's for, for biologists, it's more or less a gross state. So fungi can, of course, have a lot of morphologies. Mm-hmm. If we know you know, mushrooms, you know, the champignon on our pizza. So this is all like fruiting bodies of like fungi that really make these huge mycelia in, in the ground. But then there's also other fungi, like for example, yeast, and they just grow as single cells. And this hmm. single celled fungus is called a yeast. So there's actually a lot of different species that we call yeast. There's also fungi that sometimes grow in this yeast form, meaning just these like single celled uh, fungi, and sometimes grow as mycelia. You're in the Netherlands. Where exactly is Groningen in the Netherlands? It's in the northern Netherlands. It's about mm-hmm. two hours uh, north east from Amsterdam. I think Amsterdam is probably the best known they city. They anchor spot most people here. Yeah. Right. So uh, the Netherlands is like very populated in the south. It's called the yeah. Randstad. Or the, towards the north, it's very agricultural. So towards, mm-hmm. like if you take a train from Amsterdam to Groningen, you drive through a lot of land, like a lot of uh, agriculturally used land. And then at one point, you arrive in Groningen. <laughs> Got it. Are those those fields of greenhouses that are illuminated at night that I read about? Uh, actually, the greenhouses, they must be somewhere different because I don't see them. Or maybe they're just not located next to the train track. So it's mostly <laughs> actually it's kind of like small national parks, but it's mostly agricultural land. Potatoes, onions. I don't know what this other green stuff is that grows there. I but, understand. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. Cows. <laughs> so 
Tell us about what you do as a professor. I know that you have something called the Billerbeck Lab, which has what I have to point out is the only picture of a lab I have ever seen that features five women on the staff page. I just went that, I went, that like makes me so happy. Although maybe that's not the exception. Maybe that really is the rule in the area you're in. But tell us about what you do. Yeah, no, unfortunately it's not the rule. But, but I'm also very happy about this because I do actually have a lot of women in my lab, which is a bit coincident. And I'm a bit worried about the diversity in my lab. So I always say, I also hire ah. men. I also hire men. <laughs> but <laughs> coincidentally, Did all the know? applications for my PhD positions I got where it's like I had fantastic women applying and I really also like and take some pride in kind of mentoring them and uh, seeing them develop. So that, that's a lot of fun. But I also hire men. My major goal is still the driving force is to really engineer yeast and bacteria towards their application in the bioeconomy, in human health, in agriculture. So this is, of course, very broad, but it's still kind of the driving force. And within mm -hmm. this bigger topic area, I currently work on antifungal proteins that are actually secreted by many yeasts. And interestingly, they participate in a warfare against each other and against other fungi in the environment. And maybe warfare is a bit kind of um, very, very, no, very it's negative. Dramatic. It's dramatic. The, the, this, this made them evolve um, yeah, the, the proteins that are toxic for other yeast. So they kill other yeast, which could also be pathogens and filamentous fungi. In this huh. context, of even, and, and, and what I try to do is understand how they function and how we could use them to develop yeah, antifungals, because we're currently not only facing an antimicrobial resistance crisis. I think many people have heard about the fact that many bacteria, pathogens for humans become resistant to antibiotics. But this is actually right. also the case for fungi. So fungi are huh. like, we, we know yeast is our friend. So yeast helps us baking and helps us brewing beer, all the good things. But actually many yeasts are also pathogens to humans. So they can cause really severe infections, huh. especially in immunocompromised humans. But they're also a huge issue in agriculture. So about 30% huh. of our crops are destroyed annually by fungal pests. And also a lot of fruits and other products are destroyed post-harvest by spoilage, which is also due to yeast or, or, or fungi. So this is a huge, huh. huge issue in agriculture, which could be controlled over the last decade by using a lot of uh, pesticides. But I think now with the European Green Deal, for example, we're trying to move away from these pesticides. There's also right. a huge issue with the fact that many of these antifungals have been co-used in the clinic and in agriculture. So that... What does that mean? That means that... What does that mean, co-used? That means that the same molecules that we use to control plant pests, so that I really use yeah. in agriculture, are also used in the clinic. So humans get the same molecules. And that is actually not done with antibiotics because the risk is always oh. that you develop, that the more antibiotics you use, for example, the higher the risk for resistance buildup because the, the microbiome of the world gets exposed to these and they learn how to counteract them. So this is something that is really not done with antibiotics. But with antifungals, it's actually done because we have so few of them. So people were not concerned about them that much. So um, yeah, what I try to do in my work is address a bit this, this challenge by really understanding how fungi themselves kill each other in this warfare. And if we can find ways on Achilles heels, how to really target them and how to really control them in a bit more natural way. So that's a bit the idea. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's what we study now with this applied aspect in our mind. So I went to ChatGPT and I asked ChatGPT, how can generative AI be used to design and optimize synthetic biology? And ChatGPT gave me a bunch of questions. So I'm going to see if any of these actually make sense because you actually <laughs> know this. And it says, how might, so this is the first question, mm -hmm. how might generative AI be used to design new biological systems with enhanced functionality? And what are the potential benefits and risks of such systems? Yeah, th that is definitely a good question that was part of the field from onset on, because of course, when you tinker okay. with DNA, when you tinker with organisms, you might create something very harmful. So I think there's, you know, I might just take a very uh, recent example. I think it's still unclear, for example, if the coronavirus evolved naturally or if it, if it actually escaped from a laboratory where people were trying to 
maybe even not with a bad purpose in mind, trying to understand how this virus works and how you can make it even more potent or less potent. So whenever you tinker with DNA and then whenever you try to understand systems or purposefully engineer them towards a goal, they might also turn into something that is uh, very harmful for humans. As I said earlier, biological engineering has a lot of black boxes in it. So we really don't fully understand what we're doing. So there is always a risk factor in it. And how do you protect against that risk factor? How do you insulate your lab and the people who work in it? Yeah, so we do, of course, have uh, so-called GMO regulations. So GMO stands for genetically modified organisms. So many people, not only in synthetic biology, many people work with genetically modified organisms because many disciplines in biology require that we modify DNA of organisms and then kind of understand the effects of these modifications. So we do, of course, have our laboratories. We don't do our work in, in, in kitchen at home. We do always make sure that we, you know, destroy our bio waste accordingly before it goes out into the nature so the DNA cannot escape. We do train our students into properly discarding and working these genetically modified organisms such that they cannot escape into the environment. We also have four more risky projects, risky in a sense of like once we start working with pathogens, for example, we have a, a second level of safety, which is uh, in the Netherlands, it's called ML2. In the, in the US, it's called biosafety level two. It's, it's a more closed laboratory. So it has kind of like a, a, a lower pressure inside. So kind of air would always go in rather than out. You have to really register who goes in, who goes out. You, um, uh, what else? Um, you Do you wear those bodysuit things? Uh, no, this is actually, in, in, the, in the laboratories we work in, this is not required. This would be biosafety level three. Ah. So currently we are rather concerned of our microorganisms getting out rather than us getting a real infection from them. So the, the biosafety level of three is really the ones where people work with really dangerous pathogens for humans. I, I'm not doing that type of work. <laughs> that sounds like a relief. So, but it does bring up this interesting question, which is around generative AI, since it can deal with billions and trillions amounts of data. Does it have impact on the kind of research and modeling that you do? Yeah, definitely. Let's say in the last... Three, four years, we had a huge amount of uh, publications coming out that use artificial intelligence to predict, for example, how proteins can fold, that also predict how certain engineering uh, designs, how certain designs might work uh, and which designs might better than others. So this is uh, like machine learning, for example. And given these papers came out in the last two or three years, it means that people have been doing this research already for like, no, maybe five years earlier. So I think the biggest impact is really what I just said about protein folding. So there's one algorithm that was released, I think it was like almost two years now, which uh, is called AlphaFold, which, which helps us predict how proteins fold. So protein is basically a string of amino acids that is encoded in a gene that gets translated from a gene. But until now, even though like, you know, a decade of research, we were unable to really know how it folds into its tertiary structure. And this structure, how it folds is really important for the function of a protein. So usually we use tools like crystallography or electron microscopy to really experimentally determine the structure of these proteins. But it was really hard just from the sequence alone knowing how it would fold. And um, this usually to get the structure of a protein would take researchers years and years to actually, you know, purify it and then uh, do crystallography. So it was a very, almost a, one of the bottlenecks for some of the engineering, because often for engineering, you need to know the structure of these biomolecules. And this AI is now able to just based on sequence, predict how the structure looks like. We're still debating how good these predictions are. Some are very good and how much we can really just use them as if they were experimental data. But definitely this was like one breakthrough technology that artificial intelligence delivered that we can use every day. And it's open and it doesn't require computational knowledge to use these, these algorithms. So that's, that's really a huge leap forward. Do you think just in general that generative AI will be, will affect how basic research is done? I can see it for applied research, but I just was, it's an interesting open question. How does it affect the sort of world of research? Yeah. What I just mentioned, so this protein folding algorithm, it is also very helpful for basic research because we all need this information, um, the structural information to better understand how these biomolecules work on the, on the basic level. 
But I also want to give another example, which we actually just discussed in, in, in one of our recent staff meetings. That's uh, indeed chat GPT. So how do you deal with like artificial intelligence that actually creates text? Because a lot of research is based, at least the dissemination of research or how we interact with each other as researchers is based on writing, writing text, writing uh, our publications, writing discussions, writing, introducing topics to others, writing reviews, and even writing grant applications. So when we ask for money and uh, we're wondering how, 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 how is that used in the good and the bad? And I think we ha obviously have to embrace it. So currently it's still, I feel JetGPT delivers very superficial knowledge. So it doesn't help me a lot in kind of really writing my research papers, although I'm trying to find out how I can use it in the best way. But I think it will definitely change the way we do dissemination and research for the good and the bad, because I think it will be more and more difficult to distinguish like really thoughts through uh, text from experts from just someone generating, uh, generating texts. It will also come to intellectual property and like who belongs. So this is a different aspect where, where science and communication will be affected through artificial intelligence. But it is a really interesting question. It's not like academic papers are written with a really sharp voice that you can say, that's the New York Times or that's the Economist where there's a voice to it. It's always written in a pretty dispassionate standard way. One, a paper about X reads a lot like a paper on Y which would tend to imply that you could see applications to speed up that process of writing those papers. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I still wonder if that's a good or a bad thing. I, st I, still, I still think, you know, certain people have a certain style in writing. And I think there is something to the writing process that includes kind of extracting, condensing your thoughts and I wonder if we sh if it we sh forces a Christmas. Yeah, it forces a Christmas, and I wonder if we should outsource that to uh, to artificial intelligence <laughs> to because then maybe we're losing this <laughs> we're losing this ability to do that ourselves. That's a bit my concern. But on the other hand, given we all work so much under pressure, it's of course also a great help to speed up certain things. And I think, why not? You know, if we can speed up um, dissemination and in, in the writing process and just get more science done in a shorter time, then, well, that I see the benefits of that. Could you ever see yourself, because my assumption is that there's so many publications on any particular area that it's almost impossible to read all of them and actually digest them and think through how it applies to what you're doing. Yeah. Do you think you could, you know, develop your own platform and say, I want all the, I want ChatGPT to read all these 25 papers and tell me the five things that I should remember? I think that would be great. As a scientist, we're of course always doubting. It makes a decision process. It, it decides for us what are the most important ones. And I wonder if it would decide in a good way, but it is at least a good way to get a first impression about what is out there. How much has already, how much has a field been, been researched? What right. should I know? So I think for at least getting a first impression, it's, it's great. Uh, maybe, but, but then again, I think we should also be careful about which decisions does it make? Does it really deliver neutral information about, you know, these are the topics or what type of decision does it actually make? Because I think it's very difficult to understand or like no one can understand these algorithms anymore. They have a mind of their own. Um, so it might over time then maybe be like, bias certain research fields into a certain direction without even realizing it because ChatGPT just pushed everyone into this direction coincidentally because of some line of code that was just in there. So that How did your years at the ETH prepare you for what you're doing? So I think the ETH was the first place for me where I realized that research can really be translated into companies. So this was new to me. So I can, actually, I had done my master thesis at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen. So this was associated. And Max Planck in Germany is really basic research. So it's almost forbidden to, and that's also the purpose of it. So it's really forbidden to think about applications. You, sh you should really answer basic questions. And uh, transitioning from this position in, into ETH was really, where professors were just having startups and where there was like this whole translational department where people were really thinking about across these boundaries. So this really excited mm -hmm. me at the time. And, and so all this is also academia because at the time I somehow thought there's these like two ways 
either academia or either in an an industrial career, but I didn't see it overlapping. And this was really something that I very quickly learned at ETH and what I got really excited about, that this can happen in the same career. And this is also encouraged by by a university. And that was really exciting to me. You can use the word and. Exactly. Not just or. Exactly. (laughs) That's fabulous. So, Sonia, thank you so much. I've got some closing questions I'd love to ask. What is your favorite place in Zurich or at the ETH? Where do you like to go? At ETH, I always like the Politerrasse. So I especially, because <laughs> during, when I worked at ETH, I loved to go to the sports. I think it's called Polisport or something, because I found that mm-hmm. really great how much opportunity there was to just stay fit for free. And I was just working above mm-hmm. it. Then afterwards coming out and I like the view and just like having my lunch. So I really, whenever I come to Zurich, I just go back to the Poli Terrasse and enjoy the view. Fabulous. And when you were growing up, let's say you were eight years old or nine years old, what did you think you wanted to be at that time? All right. I don't think I had any idea what I wanted to be as a child. I grew up in a very small town and I had a very lovely childhood. I went basically horseback riding every day. And oh, that uh, sounds fabulous. it was very fabulous. Also, this is a question I get asked very often, but I don't think I really had an idea what I, what I wanted to be. I wasn't picturing me in any type of position. So I think it, which maybe speaks to the fact that my parents kept me like very nicely sheltered in my childhood. Just like, have fun and uh, think about that and later. worry about it later. And worry about it later, indeed. You mentioned curiosity. And you mentioned learning. So what are you reading now? What are the books that are on your nightside table? What are the podcasts you listen to? Actually, uh, if I just pick the first book that comes up here next to me, it's a Kamala Harris biography. So what I uh-huh. do like reading is actually biographies of people in leadership positions, uh, not necessarily huh. to learn, but rather because it really intrigues me where people come from and where they're going and what motivates them. I think when I mentioned that I studied history, I I like context. I like understanding why we do things and why things happen. And I think before that, I read the biography of uh, Barack Obama. Maybe also because I lived in the U.S. I'm also very intrigued in especially like American history and American politics, just because it's also so complex from... Here, I thought you'd say it was so dramatic. (laughs) (laughs) From the diversity of people that come together in the U.S., yeah. Very, very cool. Well, Sonia, thank you so much. This was a fabulous conversation. Really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much for having me, for inviting me. It's really a pleasure and it was really a, an honor to be on that podcast. Wonderful. I'm Susan Kish, host of the We Are ETH series, telling the story of the alumni and friends of the ETH Zurich, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. ETH regularly ranks amongst the top universities of the world in terms of cutting edge research, science, and people. The people who were there, the people who are there, and the people who will be there. Please subscribe to this podcast and join us wherever you listen. And give us a good rating on Spotify or Apple if you enjoyed today's conversation. I'd like to close by thanking our producers at ETH Circle and LE Media, and to thank you, our listeners, for joining us. (laughs) 